Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We are very, very delighted to have you as the Institute of uh, Banking and Financial Services for this very important webinar. Thank you for putting our time and finding it useful to uh, join us today. We have a very simple program. We shall have a, a bit of introductory remarks from myself, and then we shall introduce our panelists. Today we are going to have a keynote presentation from uh, one of our panelists, very known, well known to you all. And then uh, we shall also have a panel discussion from all the other uh, panelists who I'll introduce shortly. Then we will have a question and answer session where you can all have an opportunity to ask your questions. And to do that, I'm going to request you to kindly post your questions in the Q&A session, section of the, uh, of the portal. I think you'll see it. And if you have any other comments and stuff like that, you can put them in the question and answer session, like question and answer uh, in the chat room. There is a chat room that you can go to and uh, give whatever comments that you have. And so without wasting any time, I would like to appreciate very much our panelists. Uh, Mr. Matthias Katamba is the first panelist. And uh, Mr. Matthias Katamba is the CEO for DFCU Bank and also the chairman of UBA. We've got Ms. Sarah Arapta. Sarah is the CEO of Citibank and is also the vice chairperson uh, of UBA. We have Mr. Fabian Kasi. Mr. Fabian Kasi is the CEO of Centenary Bank, and he has also been a board member at the Institute of Banking and Financial Services, as well as a council member of the Institute. Dr. Peter Chimboa is well known to us all. He's a corporate coach and he's a consultant. I must also mention that uh, Mr. Matthias Katamba is the outgoing chairman of the board of uh, Uganda Institute of Banking. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the panel that we have. And I am Goreti Masate, uh, the CEO of the Uganda Institute of Banking and Financial Services uh, from uh, 16th of March, 2020. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank, uh, already thank ICPAU, a sister professional body that have uh, collaborated with us on this particular webinar. Thank you very much, and we're looking forward for much more collaboration. So friends, before I let Dr. Peter Chimboa kick us off with the keynote speech uh, presentation, I would just like to share with you about the Institute so that you know exactly what we do. Uh, very quickly, very quickly, the Institute Obviously, is a training institute. We are member owned by corporate or institutional members. And these are the commercial banks and supervised financial institutions, as well as individual members, most of whom work with financial services uh, companies. Our patron is the governor, Bank of Uganda. And our mission really is to promote professionalism and inclusion through market-led training, research, and consultancy to providers and users of financial services. Why is it important for inclusion? I just put this chart here so that you see exactly the task we have got ahead of us. And of course, if we professionalize the industry, then we are more sure to achieve our inclusion objectives. You can see clearly if you compare with South Africa, at 77, we are only at 11. Our nearby uh, neighboring countries, Rwanda 26, we are at 11. And Tanzania at 13, we are at 11. So there is quite a bit of work to do there. What we are doing, uh, we've got an industry-wide training framework. We train uh, people at entry level, at mid-level, or specialist. And then we do ethics and professionalism in the industry. We do short skills that are really geared to uh, improving technical ability in the different functions in the industry. We do short, uh, short skills that are social emotional, your supervision, emotional intelligence, and courses like that. 
We do microfinance because we know some of the banks do a level of microfinance or have customers that actually are microfinance customers. We do professional and postgraduate training, but we also do leadership and, and governance. And of course, there is the practical training, mentorship, project-based training, that is something that we are going to do very soon. In terms of our delivery model, we have a face-to-face, in-person training. We have a very versatile e-learning platform facilitated uh, where you can do facilitated online study that is scheduled, or you can do self-paced online study. What we are seeing in the future, we are looking at uh, restructuring our membership to uh, support the professionalism agenda of the industry and of the institutes, as well as of members. And we are also going to uh, put in place a very rigorous continuous professional development to focus on contemporary and emerging issues. We are working with lots of partners. We've got partners with the uh, local university, partnerships with the local universities. We have regional partnerships with the Kenya Institute of Bankers, the Tanzanian Institute of Bankers, and Rwanda Bankers Association. And then we also have international collaborations with the London Institute of Banking and Finance, Chartered Institute of Securities and Investments, and the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. We do quite a number of their courses here, and we help them supervise uh, a number of their initiatives. Then, of course, we are part of the Alliance of African Institute of Bankers, uh, the Global Banking Education Standards Board, and the World Conference of Banking Institutions. Our vision of success, that we have an industry that has got a lot to offer, a lot that anybody anywhere could actually access, and that they are able to meet everybody's needs. So our quest is that you join the vision for the country, for the industry, and uh, I thank you very much. So that's in brief about uh, UIDFS, and at this point I'm going to request Dr. Peter Chimboa, to please do the keynote presentation. Thank you. Dr. Peter Chimboa. So, thank you very much, and uh, I, I'm very happy to be here and uh, share some guest best truth, but also uh, opinions and ideas that can be subject to debate and the discussion thereafter. Uh, I thank very much the organizers, and uh, I will set the stage for. Uh, more exploration and possibly inquiry and discovery. I would like to start with the, the mind shift in terms of our understanding and appreciation of what work is today and what is the workforce that we need and that we have to work with, but also the workplace that we're going to work in. But beyond that, uh, also people who probably not necessarily directly depend on a bank, but indirectly depend on the bank. Um, the idea today is uh, how do we respond or how do we react to the crisis? Uh, if we see crisis as a crisis, then we sink. If we see crisis as an opportunity, then there's every possibility of us rising and taking advantage of this crisis. Uh, uh, at this point, I would like to suggest that any leader in the banking industry today would want, number one, to do just about five things. To take off time to recognize how people who directly or indirectly depend on the bank, how do they feel? Feeling is almost everything. The second one is to create aspiration for post-COVID business resilience. And the third is to strengthen capability to engage and work with the regulator or regulators, and also government. And the fourth is to watch out for non-COVID risks. And these are risks that have been with us and will still continue. They've never gone away. So we talk about COVID, we need to look at also the non-COVID risks. 
And the fifth one, and five one, talks about how we, what we got wrong. So a number of banks, and I think the, the, most of the banks, most of the financial institutions have gone through the various stages. You had a United States. You have also have developed and created business continuity plans, disaster recovery plans, but also contingent plans. The contingent plans that you have developed are in response to how did we get in this situation? How come we never saw that our business model is going to be completely disrupted? Even the best statistical modeling could not have predicted the onset and also the magnitude of this pandemic. So there, there are five background questions in terms of the mindset, the mindset shift, the change of behavior for, uh, for leaders within the banking sector. A man called Winston Churchill said at the height of the Second World War that this is not the end of it all. And he says also that it's not even the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning. None of us knows whether we are going to have a resurgence and we are going to have another phase of, of COVID, we don't know. So, but we are placing ourselves in a situation where we have to develop capacity and a culture for anticipation, a culture which is defined as agility. Why? Because we don't know. A man called Donald Rumsfeld, who was the Secretary of Defense in the United States government, once said that we know what we know, but we know what we don't know. And the toughest of all was we don't know what we don't know. And that's key. So this brings me to the second point, which is the need for developing a culture of agility to respond to the five key points that I mentioned at the beginning. The capacity to take off time to recognize the feeling, not only of staff within the organization, not only the, 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 the people who work for the bank, in other ways like vendors and suppliers, but also those who depend on the bank in other ways, the like customers and so on. And how are they feeling? What are their pain points and friction areas? How, how are we defining our business? Sometimes when I meet bankers, I ask them, what business are you really in? And they just say, I'm in banking. So I say, you are in banking. And they proceed to define banking in a very narrow form. Because they, today the business model is not about necessarily the banking that we need. We live in a very diversified ecosystem that is very networked. Our business model creates what we call the new business, the new banking generation. Banking is not where you go. Banking is what you do. A place of work is not where you go. A place of work is what you do, in respect of where you are. So when you talk about banking today, we are talking about a destination where customers navigate their life events continuously and company. When Amazon started selling books, we say there are online books that we buy from Amazon. Amazon, is it now about books? No, they were able to discover other pain points and different places for customers. And they are now doing a lot more. They have a whole pipeline of solutions that they give the book leaders. So the, the mm -hmm. idea at first was to sell books. But now the issue is what lies within the pipeline? We've created a platform, but what lies within the pipeline? So this is anticipation. Anticipating what will be needed. Anticipating what will be required. Anticipating our business model is changing. A professor called Theodore Levy in 1960, presented his seminal work to professors and business people in Harvard in 1960. And this seminal work was entitled The Myopia of Marketing. Other people called it the Marketing Myopia. And the question he asked here was the same question we ask today to the bankers. What business are you really in? If you are in banking, MTN is already providing financial services. Airtel is doing so. There are so many other things that can be. What business are you really in? Defining that will determine the future of banking. And this revolves around two 
main subject. The one is about customer. What are the key interests, preferences, and concerns of the customer? And the second one is the scope. This is exactly what Safaricom has been able to do. Safaricom was into mobile telephones. Safaricom has a whole range of pipelines into many areas, over 15 or 18. All of them to address the friction point of the customer. So the next one is to generate confidence. The confidence to be able to inquire, to experiment, and also discover new ways of embracing the customer needs and interests. And so on. The, 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 the third in Agile is initiating action, which means testing out and experimenting and making mistakes. So the banking platform, the banking place is going to be a place for experimentation. Uh, and failure is going to be a badge of honor. The next one is reverse your thinking. Reverse your thinking from banking being an activity that you do or where you go and do work. No, it's changing now. We have a number of, uh, uh, some, a lot of your staff, and so working uh, remotely, in order to produce work, and you are engaging them, you are motivating them. So you, 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 there's nothing called a quarantined brand. No, you're motivating them, following up performance in what they're doing, but also trying to work around their mindset, their energy, the, the cohesion with the supervisors, and so on, even if they are, are remotely working. And the same goes for your board members, the same goes for you, the regulator. So things are changing. A, mind, a man called Oscar Wilde said, a mind once stretched by new experience can never return to its original dimension. It takes approximately 66 days for human behavior to change. This is according to the European School of Psychology. The, 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 the journal they produced in, in, in April was talking about COVID. It, says it will take 66 days approximately for mankind to change behavior. And it really, uh, the pre COVID behavior and attitude is very different from the post COVID uh, attitude. And that is about liberty of thinking, changing the language. We just come to know now that there are essential services and non essential services. And this is something very interesting. We have just come now to know that the kind of skill sets we need are going to be very different. Banks now have to work very carefully around micro skilling, upskilling and reskilling. There's a complete new set of uh, uh, skills required to drive the digital transformation. Why? Because it's the, it's the tool of war now in terms of the new banking, the, the new generation uh, banking. And the last thing is evaluating outcomes, evaluating the results and so on. So agility is about flexibility, about speed response. So it's going to be very challenging for us, especially to start on the journey of building an agile culture. Um, so how do we manage, how do we go through this crisis? And I want to mention to uh, our, uh, uh, our colleagues who are in, uh, in this conversation that as we talk about reopening, uh, we need to remember that uh, first of all in the workplace and also with staff, we need to consider a few things before we open. The, whether the workplace and the community around our workplace is still requiring significant mitigation uh, around COVID. Whether the reopening is in compliance, com in compliance with what government has set as regulation, and also whether we'll be ready to protect our employees. That's very important. And the second point is to uh, the recommended safety action in the place of work, especially uh, hygienic practices such as hand washing and wearing a face mask. Uh, we have to look at cleaning and disinfection and ventilation, physical distancing, social distancing, and also limiting travel, training staff on safety actions and taking them through the drill. So as we reopen, we need also to look at our capacity and capability to do ongoing monitoring in our workplace. So we need to be open, but we need to monitor, check for signs and symptoms. We need to encourage our employees who are sick to stay home. We need to plan for when an employee gets sick, what happens monitor staff absences, and also be ready to close if there are increased cases. Now, introducing agile ways of working in the new workplace, because we know work means what? Work means what you do. So you will find now former staff of, bank, of uh, a bank are going to be working for different individuals. We have now the onset of gig contracts. It's a gig economy, very network uh, world. So uh, how many employees do we need? No, there will have to be this structure. Why? Because the model is changing and it has been driven by a new structure to deliver the kind of wonderful customer experience that customer needs now. We've created new customer journey. So we, we, we 
we, have, we need to apply care more broadly than ever to the customers and staff and engage with the radical emphasis uh, and the complete, you know, provide complete transparency, communication especially, uh, communication has to be frequent, has to be regular, and it has to, work to, to be applied in a mass media model, whichever means possible. Communication is very key. Now, hold firm to your commitment to diversity and inclusion. Uh, and then balance consistency and equity. And it makes me sure that, of course, in order to succeed, uh, you must be uh, aligned. Now, banks need to reimagine. We talk about today as the generation re. It's called the generation re because this is the age to reimagine the future. Reimagine who we are, number one. Reimagine how we operate. Reimagine how our growth model is going to pan out. This is the time for us to reimagine the technology that we need to work. Reimagine the human capital talent optimization. This is the time to reimagine our innovative capabilities. Replacing fear with hope, indeed, but also replacing risk with ingenuity and creativity. Creating nerve centers within the organization. We have to reimagine collaboration and cooperation and commitment. Today, we are working around models, and the bank will work around models of what we, we call uh, pipe, uh, platforms and pipelines. So the platform Dr. Peter, is... Dr. Peter, okay. I am I'm receiving comments. Uh, we are receiving comments in the chat room that the volume is a little low. Okay. Uh, kindly up it a bit. Okay. That sounds better. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Much better, thank you. Okay, um, I, I was just saying that, uh, uh, what, first of all, reimagining is more about, like I said, the technology, the talent optimization, uh, the innovation and the collaboration but also communication and then data, building data capabilities and so on. So banks will, uh, will need to recover revenue, but probably, and rebuild operations, and rethink the organization itself in terms of structure, in terms of, because things are not going to be the same. We have just said there is no way you can tell anyone that the business you are really in is banking. That's not possible now anymore. So that means that we, in recovering revenue, we have to start working on the mindset, not on the staff. The people who depend on you directly, but also people who don't depend on you directly. We need to know exactly what do we need to stop, what do we need to start doing, and what do we need to speed up. The, the, the fourth one is the acceleration to the adoption of digital solutions, but more about digital transformation. We're going to see quite a bit of challenges in the area of cybersecurity, crime. We're going to see more con artists, we're going to see more crime in many forms, and we are going to be uh, experiencing uh, a situation that will be tougher before it gets better. So uh, the, the, the era of re is the era for reimagining the capacity to use whatever is available to us to anticipate the future and take action before the future settles in. So um, we don't have to forget the community, and we have to remember that in our definition of resolution of this, uh, working through these crises, is we need to know who we are as a bank. We need to know how we operate, and we need to know what our growth model is. And we said that we cannot define our growth model very narrowly around products and so on and services, because these ones are changing to remove friction points. And so goes also with the community, building shared value system, working and participating in the community activities, not as a, a one-off, as a, a whimsical activity, but something premeditated long-term and value adding and value protecting. Uh, the five key questions as I, I prepare to finish is that uh, these are five questions that an agile bank 
in terms of the kind of work that is done, the workforce, but also in the workplace. Uh, and I would like to start with the very first question. Uh, and this question, uh, I, it's a question that one person likes a lot. There's a man called Jeff Bezos, who is the chief of uh, Amazon. Every time he meets his top executives in the boardroom, there are two questions he asks. What are we missing? What is our next opportunity? Or where is our next opportunity? Just questions. Leaders of banking now need to get used to the fact that questions are very important rather than giving answers. How are we going to reduce costs by so much over this period of time? Questions reveal anomalies. Questions uncover new truths. Questions inspire creativity and ingenuity. So we rely on questions. And those are the five questions that leaders of banks, agile banks, agility means flexibility, responsiveness, under control and speed. So where are we going to play and how are we going to win and keep winning? Lastly, I would like us to have some quick reflection for the multi-generational workforce. We said that work is where you go. So it's not where you go, work is what you do. Banking is not where you go. Banking is a destination where customers navigate their life events. And uh, so we create a flexible work culture, not only in terms of time, not only in terms of structure, but also in terms of talent acquisition and talent optimization. Leveraging technology without doubt, and increasing transparency around compensation, rewards, and career decisions. Especially the area I mentioned about micro-skilling, upskilling and reskilling, and also knowing very well that it's not enough now to be uh, a one-skilled person. This is the time to disrupt the identity of uh, members of our staff, disrupt the identity. The next one is uh, build a sense of community within the organization and consider introducing or accelerating opportunities for exposure. Investing time to listen and stay connected with people. I didn't say talk to people, I say listen. Listen, know how they feel. And this is where I started when I was beginning, that there are five areas. Take time to recognize how people feel, create aspiration for post-COVID resilience, strengthen capabilities to engage the regulator and government, but watch out for non-COVID risks, and also find out what went wrong. How come your business model cannot survive this COVID? And finally, one size doesn't fit all. And this is the time to customize and see what works for you. I thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, PK, for a very, very insightful uh, keynote presentation. I wish all the mics were open. We would give you an, a, I mean, a really a stunning ovation, let me say, if we are all in the same room. But I'm sure all of us have been really, really challenged. To my dear panelists, this is a total new way of thinking and doing business that is being proposed to us because of the re, the re era, reimagining era that PK has introduced to us. Having said that, just to go a little bit back to the topic, the banker, work, workforce and workplace, this speaks to the changes that we have seen. At the end of the day, we know banking and financial services industry is the backbone of, the, of uh, the development of any state. So, and its continued survival and growth is critical. We know that what, had, with, with what has happened, a lot has changed. Listening from what PK has said and what we are going to talk about, we would like that at the end of it all, all our listeners understand the evolutionary effects on work, the what and how institutions are delivering uh, services to their customers, hopefully responding to what Pike has said, the workforce, the change in the skills, in the attitudes, aptitudes, and headcounts as we go along, and then workspace. 
how is this changing and what are the implications for it? I would like you to kindly keep everything that PK has talked about at the back of your mind and let's now deal with the situation on the ground and then we shall put it together with PK's insights at the end of these questions. So my first question will go to Matthias. What's, what's been the impact of COVID, COVID on the sector and what have been the most significant changes? Matthias. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Goretti. And uh, let me also thank PK in a special way for those very, very, very deep, deep insights, which are reality, by the way, Goretti, when you say, let's get on the ground, what the realities you've had from PK's uh, uh, presentation there is actually what's on the ground. So I think changes are uh, upon us in many ways. At a macro level, uh, if you see what's happened around the world, uh, bring that to home and see how the economy has been disrupted in every way. Uh, the key sectors which we've all uh, been looking at uh, for growth, tourism, U Uganda by its very nature, gifted by nature, uh, tourism was always going to be a major driver. And if you look at the number of people employed in that, and if you look at uh, global supply chains, even locally, even if you just look at what the pandemic has created between us and our immediate neighbors, in terms of logistics and tracking, uh, just goods, goods moving from Mombasa to, to, to their final destination here and what that, that is like at the moment. Uh, you know, the impact uh, on tax collections and that sort of thing, which would go directly uh, to impact the ability of government um, to intervene because these are the same resources <clears throat> that will be used. So I, I like to say that, uh, you know, banks are just as good as, uh, the businesses that they serve. So these things impact directly on our customers and necessarily directly uh, impact uh, on the sector uh, as, a whole, as a whole. So we might not see uh, uh, right now, you know, you know, challenges relating to liquidity or, um, you, you know, anything of, of, of that sort. But I think that uh, they, it, it would be too early to tell uh, the, the real impact now I would think that uh, now we are restructuring facilities and all of that, so you will not have MPS growing. But when this restructuring comes to, to, to an end, the grace periods come to an end and the customers are supposed to start repaying, that's when we will know the real impact uh, of how much their businesses uh, have been resilient. But I think we don't have to wait uh, that long. The key now is very aggressive relationship management. Uh, we should all know what's happening to our customers um, what's happening to their businesses, how are they planning to recover, what are they doing, what support will they need from us, what linkages can we support and create, uh, etc. Back to you, Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthias. I think your response has been reassuring. Uh, when everybody thinks about the, the industry now, they think it's, it's collapsed. But you are reassuring us and telling us, yes, you can see it. Yes, you probably are anticipating it, but it's not yet evident. My next question to Fabian was, um, what are the recovery plans? But considering we do not know that yet, and thinking about what, uh, thinking about what um, Matthias has just said and what Peter talked about, where is the opportunity? Matthias has mentioned that maybe we need to have aggressive uh, relationship management. For you, as we anticipate, as we anticipate uh, a little breakdown, let me say, or a breakdown in performance or lowering in performance, what are the plans currently? Uh Thank you very much, uh, Goretti, and uh, of course, uh, our keynote speaker, thank you uh, for that expose and uh, the previous speaker, as well as uh, uh, the other panelist, uh, uh, Sarah. Uh, thank you, uh, the Institute, for organizing this, and I think it is, uh, has come at, uh, couldn't have come at a better time than this in light of the things that have, up, have happening. Uh, of course, uh, we've already had uh, 
and, and shared experiences of uh, how particularly the financial sector has been affected. And uh, we are talking about uh, issues that have affected uh, staff uh, in terms of uh, movement, work styles, uh, in terms of uh, need to recalibrate their skills and possibly acquire new skills. And of course, uh, the Institute, I believe, uh, is already you know, taking account and note of this, uh, how to change the way we, we need to be training people in the sector. Uh, of course, talking about the impact to the clients, the impact to the public, as we know, the sector doesn't operate in isolation. Uh, talking about uh, how uh, we are looking at a change in behaviors, uh, people becoming more frugal in spending, people changing their priorities, and of course, people apparently trying to appreciate how important, how critical savings are. And of course, hoping that going forward, we should be seeing this, uh, you know, going to another level. Of course, we are seeing the impact to the banks themselves, the companies, the entire industry in terms of business. And I think uh, Matthias has already alluded uh, to those regarding uh, the liquidity. Uh, we've seen, you know, as management, not only in this sector, but, uh, you know, across board, uh, getting to understand that uh, if we are not doing strategic planning, uh, this is the time to begin thinking hard. And I think it came through quite well uh, through the presentation that was uh, made by our keynote speaker. Things of agility, uh, now things that uh, everybody should know, adaptiveness, uh, because uh, things are moving very fast and very frugal. And, and, and all that, and of course now we are talking about how, what do we, where do we go from here? recovery plans. Definitely, as Matthias mentioned, the effect is yet to be, you know, properly accounted for to understand exactly where we, we are going. Uh, but it is important that uh, we begin thinking of uh, post-COVID or when COVID effects, uh, you know, subside, we must have an economy that runs. And, and we are looking at the various actors in the sector, uh, the various actors in the economy, uh, everybody having to contribute, and that brings into uh, play the issue of uh, collaboration. I think now we've noted that uh, we may compete as uh, people in the same sector, but collaboration is very critical because all of us need ourselves, need us. Uh, we are working in a, an ecosystem, and we are supposed to be supporting each other. If at the end of the day we are to see uh, the economy uh, reboot or, or, or get revamped, uh, talking about banks, of course, people will be looking to banks to supporting those people who had borrowed from the banks. Uh, we are talking about restructuring now, but we know there will be those businesses that will never, you know, find uh, light again. Uh, there are those who will be crippled. Uh, it, people will be looking to banks to see how they can be helped to get back onto their feet. Uh, private sector credit will be something that everybody will need to see come through so as to reinvigorate uh, investments and uh, to be able to increase production as uh, demand also comes up again. <clears throat> Formation or designing new products in the post-COVID, I think, will be a role that banks will be expected to play. But as banks and other private sector players do their part, of course, we'll be looking to government, you know, trying to also help because, as we said, we are in an, an, an ecosystem. Physical, we expect the physical policies to be reflecting uh, uh, recovery plans, things that will be helping enterprises to come up again. The same way we'll be looking to monetary policy managers, uh, the Bank of Uganda, coming up uh, with uh, issues that will help, uh, you know, put more liquidity in the economy, that will help make banks uh, blend more, that will help to have people, you know, find easiness in trying to repay the loans that they have. So that at the end of the day, all this, but the key thing is going to be collaboration. It is going to be having everybody play their part. And uh, if it means giving money to people, especially the small ones, I think it is a thing that uh, will need to be considered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, for, uh, um, Fabian. You have raised a number of important things, but everything I hear in there is the things we need need to do. 
and uh, picking from your passion and picking from what Pique said, I think it's important that, that that happens now. So let me go and let me talk about the reskilling. You said that you're encouraging staff to reskill, to retool, but then you have a challenge that as you re-strategize, it's possible that the banks might be feeling this is not where we are putting money immediately. So whose responsibility then is it going to be uh, to undertake that skilling, skilling and retooling? I would like Matthias to say something about that. So reskilling and uh, re, 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 retooling are the responsibility uh, of two parties. <clears throat> I think that uh, the first party uh, are individuals, the staff themselves. You have to take personal responsibility of your career. Nobody carries your ladder for you. Uh, and you cannot overemphasize that. Your growth and development is not dependent on the organization in which you work. <clears throat> it's dependent on your ability uh, to scale the heights, how far you dream, how far you want to go. And therefore, your own assessment of your own individual gaps and what you need to do to fill those gaps. <clears throat> so if you sit in an assessment, you don't wait for an assessment uh, with your senior manager to say, let's do a skills gap analysis. No, you, you do that every day when you wake up and before you go to bed. Uh, take note of what you've learned and what you need to learn a little bit more and find where you need to find the resources. You know, in, in the time we've been working from home, we've learned of the immense value of, uh, of, of knowledge available on, you know, e-learning uh, resources that are being made available to us by various uh, providers free of charge. So, so the first thing is you take personal responsibility of your own skilling. Take your own assessment of the environment in your own workplace and in the industry in which uh, you are working. And then determine what the future will look like according to you. Then begin to actively uh, pursue a better you, right? So that's the first thing on the side of the employee. The second part is on the side, on the side of the organization. So the organization will be thinking, what kind of person am I going to need uh, tomorrow? And if you don't, uh, you know, pick that game really quickly, they're going to pick it for you. And you, you don't want that choice to be that the person is not you, right? So the organization will be skilling its people based on the priorities uh, of today because we're in a, uh, we're learning new things today, but also in the priorities of tomorrow uh, in terms of how they see the future are going to be. Uh, so, and those skills might not even necessarily be within uh, the organization. Those skills might be skills that they need uh, to outsource and pay to rent them. Uh, so it's a combination of things, but I see a lot of the responsibility and the onus lies uh, on the employee to see if you're going to be delivering the best value that you can and value gets priced, uh, then, then the onus is on you. And that, that's why things like the Institute of Bankers uh, is here, because it is how many industries uh, have a center of excellence that is specifically focused uh, on that industry. And you're not necessarily going to wait for your head of HR to nominate you in a group uh, to go and do a program, right? You can walk into the Institute yourself uh, and get yourself registered on, on a program. I did that many years ago. I'd spend hours uh, in that library on Kuma Road, uh, the road where Equatorio used to be, uh, picking topics that I thought, uh, you know, mattered to me. So I, I think the onus is on the employee. Uh, the institution will help. It will look for, for the skills. But by the time you leave it to the institution, you've taken yourself out of the picture. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias, for that. Indeed, we have to take personal responsibility, but we are grateful that the industry leaders are also thinking about how they can actually support the staff to retool and reskill. Sarah, let's talk about digitization. I actually thought that digitization would have come up so strongly already, but it goes to show how wide these effects and impacts are. What's the role of digitization now? And it would appear that different banks are different stages of digitization. 
for those that may have been in an, at an advanced stage? Is there anything changing yet? So two questions in one. Thank you, Goretti. Um, thank you again to the keynote speaker, Peter, uh, fellow panelists, Matthias and Fabian. I'm glad to be here on this webinar. Uh, I just, uh, thanks Goretti again. Uh, before I dig deep into digitization, just to say indeed COVID-19, the global pandemic is going to have long lasting and very profound effects on the world with the structural changes to not just the global, regional, but all our local economies and markets, the workplaces and our everyday life. As we navigate the uncertainty and uncharted territory, uh, no one knows with a degree of certainty where we're really going. When we talk post COVID, I, I, I like to think that post COVID might just mean that uh, post COVID means with COVID, we will live with COVID. So my take is the pandemic will reappear in, in subsequent waves over the next several months and years until a vaccine is developed and um, any medical breakthrough or treatment is availed. Um, it is here with us and we will live with. We'll, we'll live with it. So beyond this, our places, we really need to adapt to this new norm. And to your question, um, innovation and digitization is very central to where um, banks uh, need to be. So um, clients in this environment are really faced with a challenge um, in this very altered working environment. I mean, many clients are used to walking to the banks to do their transactions. Um, many of them, this is what they have known all their lives and, and suddenly they now need to embrace digitization. So they, but most importantly, as they look to adapt, they are looking for flexibility. So that will call for innovation um, on our parts as the banks, but also practicality built into those innovations and also user friendliness. When we adapt to technology, we all don't adapt to it as fast as many other um, you know, generations do. So flexibility, innovation, all this is going to call for agility as Peter mentioned uh, much earlier. So things like the ability to accept clients' transactions um, virtually or online transactions, these are things that most banks previously have been very hesitant to. Um, to avail given the risks that come with, with them. But now these have to be inbuilt into our processes. How do we make use of um, instructions, um, transaction instructions virtually, scanned images, email instructions? Obviously, all these have to be, um, you know, we have to be very mindful, mindful of the fraud that comes with this. Things like how do we watch cyber risks? How do we uh, train our staff to detect email phishing and all the related risks that come with um, digital um, acceleration. Um, so we know digitization makes the process for our customers uh, transacting. It's a lot more convenient and it's very efficient for us um, as, as, as banks. And, you know, it comes with faster turnaround times for processing and, uh, and, and indeed, a key tenant of digitization will be the ability for the banks to facilitate remote working. I think um, if we get remote working right and facilitate our staff to work from home, then digitization as a, a future means of serving our clients will, will serve both clients and staff um, in, in allowing us to make good use of it. The other thing I'd like to say is there are several benefits to us uh, digitizing or accelerating digitization. Things like we will become a lot more greener environmentally, um, so as there will be a significant reduction in the usage of paper. But embedding this into all our products and services is really the way forward, and it's going to call for agility of uh, the different banks to invest into the um, when I say remote working, things like how do we now find the flexibility to buy laptops for staff, uh, buy computers for staff to be to work from home? How do we access um, data to staff members? Um, in different countries, there have been banks 
that have even availed generators to, to staff members because of the um, um, instability of power. Things like um, socket makers, if there is power fluctuation to protect equipment, these are things that management has to think about. Um, how just to make that work environment as good as our office environments have been. Uh, again, the agility calls for us to think and imagine what the workplace has been, but put that in a remote working environment for that productivity and efficiency that we require from staff to continue. Thank you, Gorit. Thank you, thank you, Sarah, for that. As you kept talking, uh, you made me, you, you reminded me of uh, some job requirements that, for instance, they'll tell you as a salesperson, uh, you must have a driving permit. Now, when I hear things like generators, uh, laptops, on a wide scale for institutions, do you envisage a situation where banks and staff are going to share some of these responsibilities in some cases? Um, my take is for as long as uh, staff is um, still, you know, working and they have chosen to work from home, which is really going to be the norm now, it's upon the employer to facilitate their, that environment and things like data. <laughs> We, we never ever thought we would um, facilitate staff with data, but, but now we have to. If, if they have to be productive, they have to be efficient with less disruptions. Um, given the environment we work in, it's, it's really upon the employer to ensure that this is now embedded within um, you know, our work processes. But it's an expense we now have to embed um, into our um, uh, previous expenditures, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, Sarah. Uh, of course, we are talking about different banks and different situations, but that's very reassuring. Uh, very glad to hear that. And I thought I had claps in the background. I'm not too sure about that. Now, dear panelists, there is the chat room. The question and answer room is buzzing with questions. There is an option to type answers, but there is also an option to answer uh, you know, um, by audio. So I'll kindly request you to check there as well, but I'll also pick some questions from there as we go along. My next question will go to uh, Matthias. Last year, and it also resonates with a bit of what uh, PK said. Actually, let me ask PK before I ask you, Matthias. PK, it's very clear that uh, digitization, as Sarah has mentioned, is the way to deliver services, yes. But you've talked about, you've talked a lot about reimagining. Do we see yet or envisage a shift in demand or supply of particular products and services? You being a CEO, you being an astute, astute consumer, you who is always talking about financial awareness everywhere you go. What sort of products or services do you see emerging? Uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Goretti. Uh, you know, in uh, this period, like many people say, in a crisis, imagination is better than knowledge. And the, uh, for, for anyone to operate in business now, the, the battle has to be taken to we, we call it go to war for relevance now. Uh, we, what I mentioned earlier on was that the, uh, we need to listen very intently, deliberately, intentionally, to understand. And after understanding, plan to execute removal of all friction points a customer will experience. Because right now a customer has experienced some wonderful things. He doesn't have to walk to the bank. There are a lot of things he's able to do. He's navigating his life events, and he's not just going somewhere to do transactions. So I think the listening now is very important, but listening with the intent of taking action. 
And when we look at the era of uh, digitization, or look, digitalization, first of all, and then digitization and so on, we, we need to appreciate the fact that processes have to change in order to support a model that is changing. So for me, as a, a consumer, as a customer, if I am, uh, I have got issues now in my business, I have issues of cash flow and profitability. I have got issues of cash reserves. I have many other issues of customers probably turning this way and that way. The kind of relationship and partnership I need with the bank, and this is probably partly what the institute is supposed to be teaching, is uh, I, as, as a bank, I would like you to understand my journey, my situation. I, I have to make sure that my small business becomes intergenerational. So I need knowledge, I need tips, I need techniques, I need tools to ensure that this business survive or survives beyond this crisis. So I, I need to be, I need some empowerment, I need support, I need enablers to drive me from this point to the next point. Because the business is there already. I need the bank to understand my situation. So I think the challenge on part of the bank now is to understand and plan around the understanding of a new customer. The new customer is very fickle. A new customer is, is very easy to provoke. A new customer gets annoyed so quickly and doesn't forget. A new customer is right now spoiled for choice and so on. A customer now has got used to a new way of life and is not going to go back to the old way of life. So a lot of imagination is going to be required. But remember also that we are in the age now uh, of, uh, as you said, digitization. Uh, we are working around with artificial intelligence now. We are, we are working now with the onset of blockchain technology, uh, which is going to, uh, again, go back to the definition of essential services and non-essential services. The work of a teller in a bank now. Uh, what, 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 who is the new teller? A new teller is someone who has digital marketing skills. That's wow. something that is, yeah, that's something that we have to look at. So that you can engage with me as a customer and sell me many things. How do I keep my family together? How do I build this business for the next generation? <laughs> what are the options for financing? What are the opportunities that are available? I navigate my life events uh, using the bank platform. Thank you. I don't know what the CEOs in the rooms are thinking, in the room are thinking, but Peter, what you're asking us uh, to do as bankers is to be there, to be knowledgeable. But as we know, we usually walk into the bank as tellers and with very little background of, of real banking. And Alistair uh, Graham, Alistair, thank you very much for joining us. Alistair is all the way from the London Institute of Banking and uh, a very good partner with the Institute. And this, and he says that you raised a very good point, Matthias, regarding professional courses at the Institute. His question is, and it's very much connected to what Peter is asking of the Institute, I mean of the industry, should the contra bank mandate certification uh, mandate certification for certain roles in the bank should the industry mandate certification for certain roles in the bank especially now as i hear pk requesting that bankers think about my journey and propose things to me that can be taken by matthias and uh, fabian Sarah, Matthias. Okay, so I can uh, I can speak to it, uh, you know, a little bit, but I know that my colleagues will have deeper insights uh, on it. I think that uh, sometimes we take too lightly the responsibility bestowed upon us as people working in the financial services sector. You know, uh, most professions will require continuous professional development. Uh, you know, if you're a surgeon you know, there and you, you did surgery 10 years ago, 
I mean, things have changed, technology has changed, approaches have changed. You need to keep, you know, staying up to date and necessarily you need some certifications along the way, you know. Uh, if, if you're a lawyer, if you're, you know, you just need to, to be up to date as much as possible with the changing things. <clears throat> and so uh, continuous professional development would be a very useful thing. And, uh, you know, having a body that does that, which we already have, would be a, a good place uh, uh, to start. So it is true, you know, many people, you join as a teller and you're a damn good teller, you're promoted to, uh, you know, maybe the senior cashier or something, you're very good, you become branch operations manager. If you're really, really good and they're looking for branch managers, you become a branch manager and lo and behold, if you stay long enough and do all the right things, you know, you'll end up as a, you know, as a senior person in charge of very many people making very many decisions, uh, but not necessarily having covered uh, several other tracks uh, beyond uh, the practicality of your role, uh, you know, into imagining what a customer needs and what the customer will need tomorrow and how those changes have evolved ever since you've been doing it. So I think it's definitely uh, a good thing. It can only make the industry uh, better. I think that over time, as you know, it becomes a highly technical industry, uh, deploying more and more and more digital. It will also becoming, uh, become, uh, it will come to a point where bankers are knowledge workers, right? Put it that way. Uh, and it's useful for, for, for people working in the sector and preparing themselves for a future in the sector you know, uh, to begin to, to think as such, uh, because knowledge workers by their very nature will keep upgrading and learning more about what they're doing. Thank you, Mathias. I know you mentioned that uh, Fabian and Sarah would actually have some insights. Um, Fabian, could you please give us your insight on this particular uh, point? Uh, Goretti, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the experiences shared so far. Uh, we've always been told that uh, education is not only about counting, but in knowing what counts. Not only about counting, you learn how to count, but you need to learn what counts. And what counts keeps changing as the situation evolves. We are now in a situation where very few, if any, knew that we would be where we are now. It is now quite important that uh, we get to understand what counts in this situation and what will count going forward. And therefore, having professional bodies that are available to offer such insights as they unfold or giving knowledge to people as things unfold is very, very critical. And, and therefore, I can't overemphasize the importance of a professional body like the Institute are uh, all serious professions. I'm an accountant and we do continuous professional development every year and we have to account. All serious bodies do have this and in banking definitely it is imperative that we do have it. But one angle that has also emerged is that uh, uh, as we do the training, as we go to universities, as we do whatever you know, we are training about, uh, we, we, we need not only train to be employed, not only to, to, to train to become a tailor, to learn how to count money. At this time, uh, it has become imperative that uh, people who think in an entrepreneurial way will be the ones to carry the day. Because we've seen, I mean, some people have lost their jobs. There are those whose salaries have been reduced or they've been sent on unpaid leave. But an entrepreneur who is in control of uh, you know, what they do, who is in control of their businesses, probably that is not a nightmare for them to face. Their nightmare now is to see how their enterprises can survive uh, and to think and to, the, to ensure that uh, they are agile, uh, they are, the enterprises are able to adapt to the new ways of doing things. That is their headache now. Unlike somebody who depended on somebody to do a job, and which job now is no more, or whose salary has been reduced. So that is also another angle that uh, training institutes did, did definitely need to be looking at as we do training, so as to be <clears throat> adaptable to the new normal. 
Wow, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Fabian. You remind me, of course, you remind all of us listeners about the comparison of normal entrepreneurs and those who are, and people who are educated and how the educated get employed by the entrepreneurs. But we've also seen actually that an educated person with an entrepreneur mind would do this very well. Thank you for that. I would like to, uh, before we move on to staff, because we've touched quite a bit on work, this again talks uh, a little bit to what PK has talked about. In this period, the period has shown that there is a dire need for not only financial inclusion, but also financial literacy. What is the plan for the sector of ensuring both for its customers and the entire 42.7 million Ugandans. Because indeed, isn't there a role of bankers as an individual banker, the teller that PK was talking about, who looks at my life journey and then finds a way of including me. So what is the industry thinking about that? Both inclusion and literacy. Sarah, Sarah will take it and Fabian, you'll add some insights to that. Thank you, Goretti. Um, I think financial literacy and or inclusion is, um, uh, we all recognize that uh, for the country to reach the financial debt that we require is, is something that um, firstly um, banks should take upon themselves, but also um, from an uh, Uganda Bankers Inst Institute and um, as a training institute, this is something I believe you have prioritized. Um, certainly it is a priority from a Uganda Bankers Association. And um, as you can tell, we have partnered severally with um, um, firms like um, uh, financial sector deepening um, to try and support um, financial inclusion and literacy across the country. Uh, but it's also embedded within different bank uh, corporate social responsibilities and um, many banks do prioritize this uh, to the extent possible either through uh, trainings um, or um, education uh, through different um, in the different presence areas that they have so it, it's well embedded into the sector at an association level but certainly something I believe the institution um, should prioritize as well. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Sarah, for that, uh, Fabian, I pick on you because you have got, I think, the bi biggest inroads to the rural community. Yeah, yes, uh, Goretti, thank you very much. And uh, of course, the insights Sarah has shared are very pertinent. Uh, we, we, we consider ourselves, let's look at uh, what everybody has been going through for the last 70 or so days. Uh, this is a situation where people had to find themselves at home, uh, not moving. Uh, if they are to buy something, they most probably had to use uh, an app on their phone or uh, use mobile money or uh, use other means of uh, availing services to themselves. Now, when everybody was put under such a situation, it so transpired that uh, it, there is urgency for all the 40 or so million people to be financially literate. That is one. So financial literacy is very, has become very critical. There is urgency now for financial literacy. It became critical that uh, people ought to have saved some money. Savings as a culture, has now become something that should be a must. Because if you are locked down and you didn't save any money, it was a very, very difficult situation to go through. It has become urgent that uh, we need to limit the use of cash. Because time came when you probably wouldn't move with your cash to go to a supermarket or wherever, uh, that, you know, to be able to buy things. And in any case, the contact with the paper money you know, became a very suspicious action uh, to, to, to spread uh, the, the, the virus. And therefore, it happened that uh, it is now urgent 
we need to think of ways of facilitating payments without necessarily using cash. That's why a bank like ours has been emphasizing the use of uh, cards. There is Center Visa, there is uh, MasterCard and so on. The usage of phones, a mobile platform for you to effect payments has become very, very critical. Therefore, financial literacy now is very important and I'm sure even uh, the, the, the demand side of it has appreciated as we on the supply side of it have also appreciated and there should be quick convergence for everybody to be able to effect financial literacy. What can banks do? First of all, training and educating, but most importantly, being able to introduce products that are able to address the diverse needs of various uh, sectors or sections of the population. We should be having products that address the needs of the youth, products that address the needs of the women, products that address the needs of the illiterates, products that address those in the rural areas. And that's why recently, you know, the usage of technology has become very critical. Uh, and at our end, I'm sure you've seen us uh, introduce a product whereby you can open an account remotely. We believe these are some of the products that will be speaking to the needs of people, that will be speaking to the literacy, the need for literacy, financial literacy, so that people are able to work meaningfully with the financial institutions. Therefore, as a sector, it is incumbent upon us to ensure that we do products, we do train, and we do facilitate people, whether illiterate or, or, or elites, or in the rural areas, or young, or of whichever sex, but at the end of the day, being able to come and work with the banks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we, work, we move uh, quickly to the workforce. And my question, we've talked quite a bit about workforce already, but there's one area that we haven't touched, the health and safety of staff. What has been the impact of that in the industry, especially regarding staff and family health and safety? Matthias, please tell us. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much, Goretti. I think this time has been uh, a time of learning for, for, all, for all of us. So uh, uh, Dr. PK in the beginning talked about, uh, you know, disaster recovery plans and contingency plans and all this. I mean, we, I, I'm not quite sure that many of us planned for something of this scale and particularly uh, on the health side. I mean, uh, this is probably in our case uh, similar to maybe what in Japan they you know you know they, they were trying to do uh, when they knew there was a you know a, a nuclear crisis as a result of uh, the reactor being compromised. So at the beginning of it all, when we were seeing what was happening around the world, uh, we wondered what would happen uh, if, for instance, we began to so to see infections in some of the localities close to where we have. Uh, staff, you will recall that at that time we were still using public transport uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but since then, you know, so at that time we planned different things. We, um, you know, separated staff to see that uh, different groups don't have contact and that if one group gets uh, affected, you know, we can always uh, bring in uh, the second group and get then take people through treatment, etc. But from a more practical point of view, what we're doing now, uh, again, is just prioritizing uh, safety of the staff, uh, keeping numbers uh, down, uh, spacing uh, in the workplace, uh, again, keeping an element of teams that we can uh, separate, uh, providing um, protective equipment, um, masks, uh, gloves, and sanitizers, you know, and things like that. And just trying to see that we follow the standard operating procedures uh, that have been, you know, set up by the Ministry of Health and government, and in as much as possible, uh, try to do, you know, some additional things ourselves, and I'm sure all the banks have been transporting uh, staff, and will continue to, as I see in the foreseeable future, until uh, the threat uh, looks like uh, it is getting under control. So health and safety is a priority. 
uh, it's, uh, I think that you also have to keep evaluating um, every week on week as things change, as trends uh, change. What we, we know right now, what we know about the disease. I'm going back to PK's uh, words, those famous words of that American uh, uh, public official, that we don't know what we don't know. And because we don't know what we don't know, uh, you know, we will learn more as we go along and put in additional measures as, uh, as, 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 as we learn more. Thank you. Um, you've talked to us about, you told us about the situation in Uganda. Sarah, you've got presence. Citibank has got presence in some of the most hard hit areas or countries. What lessons have you picked from most countries compared to what we are doing here? What can we learn from them? Thank you, Goretti. Um, but just, just quickly following up on Matthias, um, which we, and I believe this is a priority for not just ourselves in Uganda, um, but also out there. Again, the, the health and safety of our staff comes first, and it's been a top priority um, in all our banks and certainly at, at, at City, um, not uh, globally as well. I think uh, as a guide, um, most employers have taken the necessary steps uh, to ensure the health and safety of their employees, whilst importantly also maintaining the ability to continue with operations and to serve clients. And again, as, as you have all said, we don't know what we don't know, but again, as the pandemic evolves with a higher number of infections, um, most um, countries, of course, have reached the realization that there's a need for country warfare to continue. And so they are currently engaged with um, uh, decisions around returning to office. And um, a lot of them have, again, uh, chosen to, to be led by data. Uh, the decision to go back to office is being led by data in terms of what are the numbers looking like? Um, I will just give an example of um, in the UK where you know, infections still continue to rise. But there's a realization that um, there's also a need for um, uh, work to continue. So most staff have been given the option to continue to work from home. And again, this goes to the preparedness with which um, uh, city uh, primarily started off with um, during the pandemic. Um, most countries have been working under split operating teams with very um, thin and lean critical staff members at the banks. And this is going to continue. Most of them have reached operational resilience already with a thin number of staff. Um, there's good client connectivity already. In fact, most countries have registered excellent client connectivity virtually even more than um, uh, prior, before the pandemic uh, when you had uh, you know, navigating through cities to make it to meetings and have to get onto the plane to conduct meetings and conferences. It's, it's, the pandemic has proven that all these things can be done virtually, and, but importantly, very efficiently and effectively. So, so that resilience in terms of uh, operations and connectivity with clients um, is, has proven very effective. Um, so again, how will we have staff work from home? It's a question of driving productivity and ensuring that um, working from home you know, is made as comfortable as possible. So the focus now is um, ensuring that the staff are supported from home. Do they have a good working place as the environment right? There's all sorts of mental health and well-being support that has been availed to staff, given the anxiety. As you can imagine, we were all faced with the anxiety and uncertainty when we started working from home. But there's several guidelines that have come up to ensure that this productivity is maintained uh, to make sure that, you know, especially knowing that this is the new norm, as we, we've all um, said um, in, in this conference. Yeah, so getting technology right, minimizing distractions, building the right habits, making sure staff have the right care. And we've just become a pro at working virtually. Communication, you know, checking in with colleagues, making sure that 
the virtual working environment or remote working environment is as good as being in office. Thank you very maybe, much, Sarah. Maybe, uh, Gretchen, I can uh, add something on that, on that subject of uh, health, uh, which we probably uh, leave out. I think uh, it's good that Sarah has talked about uh, working from home and, uh, and us and the resilience built uh, as a result of uh, managed to work, to work with very thin capacity. For instance, I can tell you that at the height uh, of the lockdown, we had 70% of the staff at home and 30% uh, 30 were effectively uh, working. 70% was on leave, 20% uh, was working from home and 10% was working in the office, very thin. Uh, now, one of the things that we overlook is the aspect of mental health. Uh, because these staff are part of the community. And when we see campaigns being run now about things like, uh, uh, you know, gender-based violence and domestic violence and all these things happening uh, as a result of people uh, s spending more time at home, uh, et cetera. You know, our staff are part of the quota. They are part of the population. Uh, when you see stress running through the the you know, the wider population. I mean, those are relatives, friends, parents, uh, close associates. So they're affected in many ways uh, b beyond their direct relationship uh, with the workplace. So there will also be aspects when people are, are, are more at home, substance abuse, alcohol, etc. all those sorts of things. So one of the things that we've done uh, is, uh, you know, put in place a counseling service and try to promote it widely that uh, staff can have access to, uh, you know, to, to counselors anonymously uh, for whatever issues they might have, uh, personal issues to deal with. Uh, and I think that that is an important aspect for us to increasingly look at uh, because this pandemic and the whole environment uh, will affect different people differently and different people will have different levels uh, of, of, of tolerance, of pressure, um, you know, and, and resilience uh, to an environment uh, like this as it impacts them and their wider community. Uh, okay, um, uh, thank you very much for pointing that out. And, and I think it's a very important uh, one for all of us. We also had people who ended up working much more at home and probably had risks of things like blood clots. So there is a lot around that area. Um, Productivity. You mentioned DFCU has many staff. So does Centenary Bank. Productivity. How are you managing to track productivity at home? And what tips do we have? Fabian, please. Uh, thank you very much, Goretti. Working from home, of course, has become you know, something of a debate. It is topical now, and the expectation is that uh, it is going to be the new normal. Uh, and I'm sure many organizations have been deliberating on it, trying to see how best to do it, uh, trying to put in place policies and procedures as part of the HR policies, very critical, so that at the end of the day, everybody is well guided. But uh, there are a few things that uh, we have to be considered. One, is uh, how do you ensure that the mindset of uh, staff is changed in that direction? Because when we told some people to, to, to stay at home and work, some of them started developing the ideas that maybe the company is trying to get rid of me, or maybe I'm not essential. It is the others who have gone who are critical. So we, we need to have a campaign that uh, drives to change the, mind, the mindset of staff to know that it is normal, and, and also we need to ensure that we don't take it as a fashion to be working at home. It has to be, they have to be derived benefits like efficiency, uh, people being more healthy, uh, you know, we need to be considered, we need to consider those very, very seriously before we say we are going into uh, working from home. Of course, performance monitoring is very important and it's going to be a very big challenge because when you are working away from your supervisor, naturally, I think that's all for human beings, especially here in this part of the, the world. We, 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 we need to be monitored. We need to be supervised. We are looking forward to like a being accountable 
physically to somebody. Now, to be able to come up with the systems that will be measuring performance so that you know that uh, somebody seated at home is indeed doing work for the bank and is doing this magnitude of work is going to be very critical and very challenging. What we are deliberating upon is now finding the electronic means of trying to monitor somebody. For example, to say you are on the system and the system is able to tell that he was in the system looking at these reports for this amount of time. That can be one of them. But of course, the other thing is to try to ensure that you only allow those people to go and work from home when you are able to measure their work. For example, to say you are supposed to go and compile this magnitude of reports and we believe they will be taking three hours. Therefore, in the morning of Tuesday, don't come, sit home and work on them, come with a report at one. You know, that becomes an easier way of measuring performance and getting to know that people are doing what they are supposed to do. Others, if you are not able to do that, it is going to be very, very difficult to just letting everybody work at home and uh, give value to the institution that pays those salaries. Uh, maybe you probably want to identify only those ones at a certain level with the work that can be measured easily and probably those are the only ones that you can allow to go for uh, working from home. But the whole thing has to be debated, uh, changing the minds of people, uh, working out policies and procedures, and of course ensuring that uh, there are proper mechanisms of measuring the work that people will be doing from, how, from home. Other short of it, I don't think it is going to be very useful for the institutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Friends, we have reached the one and a half hour mark. And at this point, it's important that we get some questions from the, uh, from the question and answer uh, room. I am going to request you to look through and pick three questions each that you can answer so that we can uh, wrap this up. But the questions are very many. What, uh, which is an indication of the need for continuous engagement with the community? And so we are going to have a responsibility to answer these questions, those that we will not have answered and send back these answers to uh, our audience. But for now, I'm going to request you to pick three that you each uh, respond to. In the meantime, I would like to recognize the presence of Mr. Thambi. Uh, thank you for, your, for joining us. And uh, I have seen that you have mentioned that in this time, Collaboration as we compete is important, and I think the CEOs already talked about that. So it's a good thing we are looking at collaboration. So I will quickly, and you also ask a question directly. Uh, okay, that's a different one. Um, there is a question that I thought is very important, and all questions are important. Hubbard Zake asks, is there going to be restructuring? Are banks looking at restructuring their staff to align with the new reality. Uh, Matthias, please handle that as the rest. Please look out for questions, three questions that we will answer. So I think that uh, I, I, and any of my colleagues uh, can, can comment on this. I think it's the responsibility of every business uh, to fit uh, to its size, I mean, to really make a good evaluation uh, of its costs and uh, the requirements that it has and to try and be uh, as agile as possible, but as lean as possible and as efficient uh, as possible. But you know, I have to tell you that organizations, again, are not machines, huh? right? So we're in this environment, uh, we have gotten into this environment, none of us for us saw it, we've seen it. I will tell you that, uh, you, you, you know, the point, like I mentioned, the, the point uh, of that that stretch, I don't see it uh, yet uh, necessarily. What I know is that the economy will come back. Uh, and as it comes back, uh, you need to get uh, your teams, you know, working at full capacity. Uh, there is a level of uh, redundancy in the system uh, at the moment. Uh, it is true. 
But uh, I think that organizations have a soul uh, and, uh, you know, d decisions uh, of, of that nature are, are, are a combination of a number of things that by the time you arrive uh, at that, you really don't have uh, an option. And I don't see in many ways uh, that in the industry uh, we have reached at that point. Of course, uh, you know, banks will make uh, decisions uh, individually, but that's my general view. Thank you. Um, as you pick up some questions, I don't know if anybody's ready. I'm going to read uh, two. Uh, Susan Lugalambi asks, executive bankers, we know that 60% of the population are not in the formal banking sector, and yet the digitization aspect appears to speak to the formal sector. So have we left the unbanked, so to speak, to be handled by fintechs? Uh, exclusively, or are banks going to do something about collaborating with fintechs, even if for CSR? Could uh, Fabian please respond to that? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, and thank you, Susan, for the question. It is not the first time we, we, we are talking about uh, collaboration with the fintechs. And I'm sure if anybody checked uh, institutions, many have collaborated and they are continuing to collaborate. Probably what will happen now is the speed which, with which they will be collaborating with these fintechs. Otherwise, fintechs were, were, were never going to be out of the equation. They were always in the mix. And uh, most institutions, if not all, recognized this. That's why uh, many have collaborated. I'm sure you've seen mobile banking platforms. They are always in collaboration with the fintechs. Uh, mobile money, almost all banks uh, are working with the mobile money uh, service providers. And this is bound to continue, and especially at this time. Uh, the, the question of uh, ensuring that as many people are included or they are being left out for the fintechs. I don't think that is the case. We've been talking about uh, uh, financial inclusion. Uh, financial inclusion means ensuring that people who never used to be served by banks are getting served. And, and the, one of the links to them is definitely going to be institutions like the fintechs. So there is urgency now to work with the fintechs. Otherwise, it has been happening. What is going to happen is the speed uh, that will increase uh, to be able to work with them. I just so wanted to speak to the earlier question of uh, whether institutions will, re will restructure. It will only be the, I believe, with the changes that we've seen and the many things that have happened and uh, a different way. We are talking about adaptability. We are talking about agility. We are, we are talking about survival for the quickest, not necessarily the fittest. Uh, definitely, if uh, there is an institution that is not going to relook at how they do things, then it will be a short-sightedness that will do that. Otherwise, I'm sure most institutions are going to be relooking and are eventually being able to restructure whether staffing, whether models of operation, you know, and things like that. Thank you, Fabian. And have you by any chance, Sarah, have you picked some questions that you could respond to? Hi, Goretti. Um, yeah, uh, some something. Uh, the question from Jane at at a tick or something about I, how how banks are managing the mental health of employees, and um, just to say that as as part and parcel of uh, the usual health offerings from uh, different banks, I think it's it will be very important for the banks to um, embed um, safety, mental health really embedded in there and, and getting health experts or mental health experts to engage um, the staff members, those who are either work again virtually and try and give them these tips because it's, it's like Matthias said in his presentation around this, it's something that we take for granted, but certainly in these um, uncertain times, it's, it's very critical. Simple tips like, you know, 
asking employees to make a plan during their, their work days, reframing their thoughts, um, limiting the amount of news they take in, you know, deciding what really what, what news they really need to hear before they turn on any TV. Is that information helping them? Asking colleagues to stay connected with, you know, not just family, friends, but um, colleagues. But again, this comes to the technology facilitation that I talked about. The, the, the employer must be able to ensure that colleagues must stay um, collaborating and interactive. Um, finding time to do things that you love, building exercise into your day, eating healthy. Those are um, requirements now. I think employers should be engaged with in ensuring that um, the mental staff, mental health is well taken care of. Thank you. Um, do you have any other two? Or... Uh, still going through. Perhaps somebody can. Uh, Thank you. And. Uh, Matthias, do you have any two? Uh, if not, I have one which I think uh, would help the staff. Alex Matua says, dear CEOs, how best can the financial institutions go about the enforcement of loan recovery measures in the much changed legal framework, given the challenge of balancing revenue recovery with social consideration? This is a very concerned staff, I believe, and there may be many like that. Uh, I think we've received clear guidance uh, from Bank of Uganda as uh, to how to restructure these loans, how to amortize the interest during the grace periods, and how to agree on uh, repayment, new repayment schedules. Of course, there have been concerns uh, that uh, installments increase, but this has been explained that uh, the increase because of the amortized interest, the key thing is to agree to, with the client whether they are able to meet those slightly increased installments or they want to increase the payment period. If they are supposed to be nine installments, they can say I'll do it in nine installments or 10, so as to be able to maintain the same amount of installments. Uh, and I think this is the education, the, explain, the explaining that uh, we need to do first of all to our staff so that they understand it, uh, so that in turn, they are also able to explain it to our clients. But I've seen quite a lot of cases where clients either have been confused by our staff because our staff haven't understood. And it is incumbent upon us to ensure that we educate, explain clearly to our staff so that they are also in position to explain to our clients. Otherwise, I don't see a legal complication as uh, we recover these loans. The most important thing is to reach a stage where a business will be in position to generate enough cash flows, because that is something that now you can guess, because we don't know whether it will be after two months, or the others where it will be after five months. So that is what we need to be discussed and if it is agreed, and in any case, there is also an opportunity to come back for the second time to do a restructure. And, and this is, uh, uh, you know, the kind of uh, information that uh, we need to be giving to everybody that will be acting in this space. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read out two more. Perhaps if you do not have, in case you have some that you felt were pertinent to be answered, you would. Otherwise, I would read two more. And then we have some parting shots from PK as we move on. Anybody identified something? Yes, Goretti, there was a question. Goretti? Yes, there was a There was a question, I, I think uh, I've forgotten the name of the person who asked it, but it was to do with the usage of physical money uh, <clears throat> you should be looked at as uh, uh, a likely cause for the transmission of the virus and he was asking what are the banks doing to try to change the mindset of the public because people are so used to the physical money the paper money and now to tell them that uh, you know you know you, you should stop using paper money 
it may take need uh, for changing of their mindset. I'll tell you that uh, I guess most banks, if not all, this is the campaign that they are undergoing, that they are doing. Uh, that's why all banks, I believe, have a mobile banking platform. All banks are now able to connect to mobile money platforms. All banks, if not all, most of them have got a usage of cards, uh, plastic money, uh, and, and so that when people go to the shopping malls or restaurants, they don't have to pull out uh, bundles of money, physical money, but rather they should be able to use their cards to pay at the point of service terminals. This is what is under promotion and uh, we have uh, told our people to adapt it or adopt it. And as I speak now during this time, a third, I'll tell you that a third of our transactions are now being effected on a mobile platform using telephones. Now, if we've got a third and uh, we have uh, like 10% using plastic money, then we should be moving in the right direction. And the hope is that uh, when we get out of this situation, we should be saying, seeing so many people getting used to using non-physical money. And that is the trend that we would want to have going forward. Thank you. Okay, so Goretti, I've seen uh, three which are similar. One yeah. from Bene Yabu, Alex Mutua, and Alistair Taylor. Uh, one is uh, DRC Factory and uh, WAFH. Have you heard of his meetings at non-working hours, days and public holidays with your teams? Is that normal? Uh, then Alex, uh, DSCOs, how do organizations protect confidential data when staff are working virtually from their homes? And the one from Alistair Taylor, how will you ensure your workforce has the digital skills they need to meet the banks and your clients' needs? I think all these uh, three questions are speaking to the new environment and the new normal. That typically banks have worked uh, in the offices. And not just banks, most companies have worked in the offices. People have come, signed in, and then when the time to leave has come, they've clocked out uh, and gone home. You may have cameras, you have supervisors looking at them, you have, um, you know, you, you know, open door policies and people work in uh, uh, communal areas and everybody can see what everyone's doing. And that gives you the sense that, uh, you know, data is protected because you're, you know, surveilling these people. I think that in the new environment, uh, it's, it's a, a different set of uh, policies, you know, uh, different sets of uh, training. Uh, the, the, the key things about ethics uh, in, uh, in a profession, uh, you know, transcend the office. And that's why going back to the, in, at the beginning of the conversation, talking about the need for professionalism and for us recognizing, uh, you know, the weight of responsibility bestowed upon us as people in the employees in the financial services sector. Uh, for customer data, for confidentiality, the kind of things that sit as the backbone uh, of anybody calling themselves uh, a banker. So it doesn't change whether you're in the office uh, or whether you have worked from home. Uh, I think the, the, the principles uh, remain the same. And having these written into uh, company policies, uh, et cetera, is one way uh, of making sure that people continue to adhere uh, to this. But of course, also tools, uh, d digital tools, uh, providing security, preventing things like uh, uh, printing uh, particular documents, changing them, altering them, uh, taking, um, uh, you know, uh, snapping, what, what, you know, snapshots of them or screenshots of them, uh, mm -hmm. etc. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think there were two that I thought we could uh, refer to. And now I am going to request you, I, a question has been, a request has been coming through for you to show your faces. That would mean you enable your videos. Uh, for whatever it's worth, for the remaining part of this discussion, please show your faces so that it's believable that you're behind the screen. Thank you very much. Um, there was a question by Peter Sewabude about health that uh, apparently... I Sorry, Goretti, I, I actually picked up that question and I wanted to take it, but very, very, very quickly. I, yeah. I think it's, 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 um, it's a very good question. 
um, because uh, as he highlights previously, it's, it's been looked at as a, a very risky um, uh, sector. But I, I think the outbreak um, is going to accelerate, um, you know, different global supply chains into providing uh personal protective gear and all the related health equipment that uh, will treat um, the pandemic uh, or the, the, the COVID. So I think the unleashing of all these supply chains and diversification in production will lead to um, vibrance in this health sector, particularly um, in that area. So banks um, should look to exploring trade funding to support this sector and um, its new vibrancy. Um, LCs, uh, guarantees, and, and general support, especially as we don't know um, where the pandemic is going. This, this, this health sector will remain very relevant to the banking sector. Okay, and uh, is there anything regarding health insurance and bank insurance and stuff like that? Because I think that could also be a concern. I can ask my colleagues to speak to that, but certainly there is, uh, uh, I think, opportunities that should arise from the pandemic, um, especially around um, um, health insurance and perhaps more on the bank assurance side as well. Um, my colleagues can speak to that. Anyone wants to speak to that? If not, I think, that, uh, uh, I think it uh, goes without saying uh, yeah. because uh, I think this is something that Fabian spoke to at length several times about what people have learned in this time that they will take forward. Uh, for instance, savings, um, you know, saving a bit more, uh, knowing that when a rain, the rainy day comes, uh, you know, you have something to fall back on. The same will apply to insurance. Uh, that ensuring, you know, against certain risks uh, that are, you know, unforeseen uh, is an important thing. And I think health insurance is one of those sorts of things. So it, I think it goes a little bit deeper into what will change in customer behavior and how will uh, customers uh, view safety uh, going forward. So, so maybe before you viewed safety as having a diversified business, which meant you have a school, you have a hotel, you have a property on Kampala Road, right? Well, through, today you have no safety because all the three are generating no revenue at all, right? Yeah. So maybe it would have made much more sense if you had some liquidity and you had some uh, uh, insurance policies that mitigated the challenges that you're going through today. So it's just, uh, it's the result of a uh, change in behavior that will uh, come out of uh, the pandemic and how people will have viewed it. Uh, and I think insurance is one of the sectors to benefit. Exactly. I, I'll tell you, I've had, uh, I've had an unfortunate opportunity to attend the burial during this time of COVID uh, with restricted attendance and uh, being able to bury very, very quickly, uh, where people have realized that uh, it was important, it has always been important to have somebody, a, a burial company that would come in quickly to help, you know, be able to help you with that kind of thing. And these are the kind of insurance, uh, you know, events that uh, will have to be taken into account. And in the process, people are increasingly getting, uh, uh, you know, understanding the importance of insurance. And bank insurance will be one of the things that uh, will be adopted as we, as we, as we move forward. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, two more, just two more, before we uh, give an opportunity to PK or to any of you. I think all of you will have one parting uh, uh, statement. Uh, the first one is we've talked about health. I'm very surprised agriculture hasn't come through. And if we, uh, and yet it's been named as one of the most resilient industries, it would be interesting to know if there are changes in what we are doing in view of that. The last one is uh, somebody asked a question about digitizing credit. There's been a lot talked about digitization, but what about digitizing credit? Uh, my panelists, that would be the last that we pick from the question and answer room, and then you will each have your parting statements. 
and the end of which uh, PK will give his and we'll close this. So agriculture, Mathieu or Fabian, whoever. So well, 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 I can give it a go. Uh, agriculture definitely has distinguished itself as one of the key sectors of the economy. And uh, we've all seen how critical food, how important access to what to eat has been, even under the lockdown. And uh, people have been involved in the production of uh, agricultural produce, have uh, been, uh, of course, doing quite a lot. The only challenge has been the market. Uh, you'll find a lot of people in the villages having a quite a big produce, which they can't uh, market because of lack of transport, prices for poultry, prices for eggs, prices for bananas have come down, despite, uh, of course, the need. So I think we've realized that there is need to perfect or refine the marketing structures uh, as we work on production. Production has been coming through. There has been good rains, but the marketing has been the challenge. And of course, as financial institutions, I think it continues to open our eyes uh, to the importance of financing agro industry. I know a lot of financial institutions have been perceiving uh, high risks in uh, this industry, but I think we've, we should be able to see that uh, once a few things have been worked upon, the marketing structures, uh, post-harvest systems, uh, storage of uh, produce, I think it is a very lucrative industry to support. And of course, uh, we, we are lucky that uh, we still have an environment that should, that produces, that gives rise to very high production of agriculture product, produce, and uh, we, we should be in position to support as uh, the financial sector. Thank you. I think just to add to that, uh, uh, I think, you, so you had the head of state yesterday, I think the state of the nation address mentioned the conversation I think he had with, uh, with Warren Buffett, who said that he invests in airplanes and, uh, and I think he told him, on the other hand, he invested in cows. And he was saying his cows are here and he wonders where Warren Buffett's uh, airplanes are. No, but, but, but I think on a, on a serious note, uh, agriculture has also suffered. And, 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 and Fabian has, has, has really said it. it. Depending on which neighborhood you live in, uh, but in most neighborhoods, you will find people selling uh, eggs at the back of small pickup trucks, right? And at some point, the trays go to as low as 5,000. Uh, this is similar to what was happening in, in, in the U.S., where the farmers were pouring milk. They couldn't stop milking the cows, uh, but they had nowhere to distribute the milk because supermarkets were not all open and people were not coming to the supermarket. So they would milk the cows, pour the milk, but they have to feed the cows. So that's a continuously going on. So in our case, it is true, uh, like Fabian has said, the key thing, the next thing, is to add, uh, you know, up that value chain uh, from, uh, from the farm gate uh, to the factory, uh, to processing, and then, you know, what we can't consume here, you know, being able to export, etc. But it will remain uh, a big thing for Uganda because we are blessed with all, uh, you know, the, right, the relevant environment for agriculture. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we've now come to the very end of this session. Uh, before I read out some one really good comment that you might want to hear. But uh, for now, Matthias, your parting shot. Well, I think uh, mine is to really thank the Institute for having organized uh, this webinar. And uh, to thank uh, Dr. P.K. for having been gracious enough to take time out of his busy schedule uh, to participate and to share his very deep insights. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Fabian and uh, Sarah, uh, for their insights. I hope that uh, I've seen the numbers have been quite, uh, in terms of participants, we started at 268, so that's a good attendance. I just want to reiterate the importance of the Institute to the industry. Uh, and, and I hope that uh, you know, these uh, you know, events like this are able to demonstrate and give us an opportunity to have a conversation about what more can we do with our own institute uh, to build uh, those key, you know, key things we need about professionalism in the industry, which will help us 
you know, to go beyond and to survive in this, this new normal, to flourish uh, in this new normal. So I just want to thank the participants for having been on and, uh, and, and, and all the presenters, the job well done. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Sarah? Thanks, Goretti. Again, taking this opportunity to thank you and uh, the Institute for putting uh, this very valuable webinar together. I trust you will arrange many more. Uh, thanking the keynote speaker, Peter, my fellow, uh, my colleagues, Matthias and Fabian, you've been great. Uh, I think my parting shot is, again, as the pandemic evolves, I think let's really continue taking the health and safety of our staff as a real critical requirement. And uh, one thing we didn't talk about um, in this forum was the importance of business continuity management. Um, as this is going to be real pressure on them, um, and we need to build this now into uh, strategies. I know we have in the past, but uh, just to reemphasize its importance now um, in terms of um, uh, priorities, but also just ensure that there's consistent testing, make sure we are more prepared in such eventualities going forward. So thank you very much, Goretti. Welcome, Sarah, thank you too. Fabian? Uh, again, uh, I just want to add my voice to the previous uh, speakers to thank you and your team. As banks, we are looking to the Institute to be adding value to the banks uh, by way of capacity buildings, because we know once that is attained, then uh, we shall have the banks deliver on it their mandate of uh, delivering financial services to the public. So we want to encourage you and uh, we are hopeful that uh, the team will continue to make the Institute relevant to the industry. Of course, what we learn today are a lot of things. If we get out of this situation without learning, uh, to borrow the words of uh, uh, the keynote speaker, I think we shall uh, have lost quite a great deal. I believe what is going on is an opportunity uh, for all of us, not only in the banking sector, but everywhere, to learn quite a number of skills, skills of adaptability, skills of resilience, skills of uh, being quick, you know, to react to situation, uh, skills of learning, because we keep to learning, and of course, planning ahead for as many things as possible. There will be difficult situations like these ones, which were always going to be very difficult to plan for, but that shouldn't stop us from having the foresight to plan, to do strategic planning, so that we can uh, ensure that uh, our enterprises continue to deliver on their mandates. Once again, thank you, and thank you to all the participants and everybody who has been following us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabian. And finally, PK. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Goretti, and also the panelists for the, the, the wonderful uh, knowledge that we picked uh, today. Uh, when I, I would like to mention that, uh, uh, especially for uh, those who are working uh, with the banks, to remember uh, that today um, we, we are not quite interviewed for the knowledge that we are picking from school, but I think we are interviewed for open-mindedness and a deep sense of curiosity and a willingness to try out things that are new, to create a seamless online customer experience, in other words, for the bank. We, we, we are, I think Fagam, Fagam is the Facebook, Apple, uh, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. They no longer require a degree for you to, uh, to be able to achieve some kind of uh, employment in their organizations. This uh, degree is not quite what they look for. They, they are looking for emotional intelligence, uh, social intelligence, digital conscience. That must be very high. Now, concrete steps that banks should take to support communities and customers they serve, while at the same time balancing their short-term and long-term planning. Uh, Madam uh, Organizer Goretti, there are just about five. And the first one is, uh, the, we, banks need to focus uh, on business continuity planning. But I, I'm probably not only that, because we don't know whether there will be a resurgence of this COVID. So I think it's important to have a, a, a kind of emergency response plan. Uh, and then the business continuity plan, and also disaster recovery plan, and the contingency plan, all the four. The second one is to show empathy to customers 
especially customers in financial distress, uh, while at the same time making sound business decisions. So uh, that's going to take quite some uh, what we call tough empathy. Number three is rethink your balance sheet. That is what, 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 rethink the balance sheet is converted into a Nigerian balance sheet um, and uh, challenging and managing especially loan stress and also customer sensitivity. And number four is find ways to trim your costs quickly. Uh, and this will come through, I think, the, uh, the upskilling and the micro-skilling and also reskilling in the digital space. And finally, is to reset your revenue outlook as an institution, as a bank. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Goretti. It's now we go to war for relevance. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much, uh, dear panelists. Uh, I have heard, we have heard uh, the request for continuous, continuing this sort of engagement. And perhaps before I say something about that, I just want you to know, I'm sure you've been looking at the chat, that the audience is very grateful for your insightful discussion. Somebody said they are very glad and delighted to be drinking from the best in the industry. So kudos to you. Uh, another one said they are all the way kilometers away, but they have had you kilometers away uh, on lockdown. Maybe one of your staff, they have had you. They are grateful. Uh, Mr. Tambi, thank you very much for the compliments to us and the panelists. And of course, thank you to everybody who has given us uh, all the compliments and ideas of how to progress and how to have many more of these. Um, on the side of the Institute, yes, we shall continue to do this. We are looking at all, we are looking at versatile ways of uh, supporting you. Some of you would like to have some international perspective. We are looking at ways of partnering with international professional bodies to see that you have dual membership here and there. Uh, we are looking at, uh, of course, restructuring the membership to fit the professionalization agenda. Yes, indeed, uh, a degree is not, uh, as Piki has mentioned, you usually find that professional courses are valued many times more than the degrees because they sort of help you to think on, the, on your feet. And uh, so that's also quite important that you get that level of agility and we are working on that. So I would like to turn off by saying thank you very, very much. First of all, to the team here at the Institute, and they are very delighted and energized by your, uh, by your support and the fact that you responded to the call. And of course, to thank the board, the board that has been very helpful and supportive of this, uh, chaired by Matthias and uh, the council. And most definitely, I want to turn off by saying thank you very, very much to the partnership with ICPAU. Uh, we couldn't have done this any better. Thank you very, very much. So friends, that's it. Uh, look out for our next, uh, uh, look out for our next uh, webinar. Also look out for, for all the prospectuses we've sent you. There are some things that are happening. Our e-learning platform is very versatile. Uh, we could even lend it to you. <laughs> we can think about that. And there is so much more else to come. So thank you and have a very good weekend.